the new Chang'e 5 mission to retrieve samples from the moon. If successful, it would make China only the third country to achieve the feat after the U.S. and the former Soviet Union. Before we get down to a discussion with real experts and people in the know, take a look at this first. Five, four, three, two, one, two, one. A new bold step in China's lunar exploration program, all systems go for the Chang'e 5 lunar probe from the Wanchang spacecraft launch site in the southern province of Hainan on Tuesday. The Long March 5, the country's largest carrier rocket, blasted off in early morning carrying the Chang'e 5 spacecraft. The mission, named after the ancient Chinese goddess of the moon, is China's first to gather moon samples that will help scientists understand more about the moon's origins and formation, and mark several other firsts in the country's lunar program. It will be the first lunar surface sampling, the first lunar surface takeoff, the first unmanned rendezvous and docking in the lunar orbit, 380,000 kilometers away and the first return mission bringing back lunar samples with the second cosmic velocity. These test China's ability in deep space exploration. Chang'e 5 works with an orbiter, a lander, an ascender, and a returner. The lander will collect moon samples and place them in a vessel aboard the ascender, which will dock with the orbiter. The samples will then be transferred to the returner. After separation, the returner re-enters the Earth alone and is expected to land in North China's Inner Mongolia in mid-December. Chang'e 5 is one of the most complicated and challenging missions in China's aerospace history. China's Chang'e Lunar Exploration Program began in 2004. It includes three goals, orbiting and landing on the moon and bringing back samples to Earth. And if the Chang'e 5 mission succeeds, China's current lunar exploration project would come to a successful conclusion. And for more on Chang'e 5 probe, joining us in the Beijing studio, Xu Yansong, Director General from the Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization. Good to see you, sir. And also joining us here, uh, our longtime friend, uh, Yang Yuguang, professor at the China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. Good to see you. And in Washington, D.C., Dr. Amitabh Ghosh, uh, who is the chair of the Science Operations uh, Working Group for the NASA Mars Exploration Rover Mission. Good to see you, sir. It's a big day, Thank isn't you. it, uh, for all of you, and certainly for the two Chinese experts, I'm sure you have a much bigger say than all of us. Uh, tell me more, uh, Mr. Yang, what does this mean? Well, Chang'e 5, we have Chang'e 3, Chang'e 4, now it's a totally new mission. Well, uh, for China's uh, lunar exploration program, we have three, uh, three simple Chinese words, uh, a bigger one and a smaller one. The bigger one called Tan, Deng Zhu. Tan means exploration. Uh, Deng means manned missions to the moon, and the Zhu means the permanent residence on the moon. These are three big steps, and also there are three small steps, uh, which are called Rao, Luo Hui, orbiting, landing, and also separating this mission. So you see, uh, these small, three small steps belong to the first uh, big stage, right. the exploration. So this mission, the separated mission of Chang'e 5, will be a very important milestone for China's lunar exploration program. Mm. Well, also to you, Mr. Xu, um, how far do we still have to wait to put a manned space mission onto the Mars, onto the rather the moon? Oh yes, uh, we have seen this 50 years ago. The uh, American astronauts landed on the surface of the moon. Mm. Uh, the Apollo program has been very successful, even though the, the program has no budget which means that there's no budget limitations. <laughs> so have, they have to spend as much as possible uh, to, to, to complete that mission. And currently we have to consider the uh, economic return of uh, missions uh, such as the uh, mission, uh, uh, human mission to, to, to the moon or the Mars. Uh, we have seen from the Artemis program, from the uh, Gateway, uh, many nations are working together uh, along with the U.S. to uh, 
put an orbiter uh, on the lunar, uh, uh, lunar orbit mm -hmm. and also uh, to achieve multiple uh, sample return missions and eventually put a um, man on the surface of the moon. Right. Uh, we also have to evaluate the economic uh, uh, return of the Chinese mission. Uh, for uh, astronauts to go onto the moon surface, we need a, a bigger rocket. Mm -hmm. And that rocket will sustain uh, its usage uh, because uh, it will have to justify that expenditure. Uh, even though we're working on that uh, on that end, and also we, it very much depends on the economic development of the nation, mm -hmm. should we have enough money to do that? Uh, so all of that put together, I think uh, with the Chang'e 5 uh, uh, mission, we will validate this whole process of lending a man to the to the moon, mm. and then probably beyond. Right, Dr. Gosh has been listening very attentively. Certainly, I'm sure Dr. Gosh, you've been watching also very closely about this uh, new mission of China's uh, to the moon. Uh, in the U.S., though, it's uh, more commercial activities about trying to put men once again onto the moon. Uh, tell me more about the latest development. How is that compared to what China is doing right now? So I think it's a different approach, but I think it's most important right now to understand the backdrop of what is happening and read what is happening. So think, um, you're in the 1930s. There is no plane service, commercial service. So you cannot connect Beijing to Washington mm. in 24 hours right now, which has become normal. Moon is just 72 hours away. So other than China, there is NASA and there is the two richest people in the world right now, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. They have made it their lifelong dream to uh, make this infrastructure between the moon and Earth normal so that you, know, you can buy a ticket and affordably and reliably fly to the moon. That is why it is so important. 50 years from now, we will remember days like this when this goal, we made some incremental progress towards this goal, and this will become very normal. Once you have an affordable way to go to the moon, everything will change. Mars is different. Mars, so people confuse moon and Mars. Mars is seven months away. For humans to go to Mars is going to take a long, long time. Mm. We don't have the technology. We don't have the money power. But the moon is very, very doable. Wow. And today is... Another day, we make the step forward. Right. That's why we have you, right, Dr. Ghosh? You are exactly working with your colleague, trying to put men onto the Mars. That's your mission, right? Uh, we're going to come back and talk about Mars a bit later. But talking about the moon, there are a lot of things that actually it's not just about putting a mission onto the moon. It's about what you learned through this mission. And how about what you learned into applications, into other things? That's how some of the te new technologies in the U.S. have started. But what about for China? Since some of the technologies are already available, what can we learn from these missions? Well, you see, for every mission of China, we have engineering goals and scientific research goals. Uh, from the aspect of scientific research, usually us that this time we choose a landing site called the uh, Mount Ram uh, Ramker, which is on the northwest region of the uh, Ocean of Storm, which is the largest lunar mare uh, of the moon. So you see, this place is quite unique because you know that uh, the Apollo program have uh, six missions land on the moon and also the former union have three missions robotic missions sample return and the nine places have examples have a history of about three to four billion years mm -hmm. so they have a very strong evidence of the uh, the series hypothesis of the formation and the history of the moon but this time this place uh, has a history potentially be one to two billion years quite different so oh. with this sample get back we can change even the uh, recognition of human being to the history of the moon. Very, very important. Very interesting. Yes. And I also understand, uh, Mr. Xu, that the way of sampling uh, during this mission that China is making to the moon is uh, going to be a bit different from the earlier missions made by the United States and also then the former Soviet Union. So tell me more about how different it is likely to be and how is this difference likely to help us uh, get to know more about the technologies we have on hand and also what we can learn about the moon. Well, the lunar surface is very fascinated by different uh, regions and different areas. Absolutely. The Apollo missions have been collecting uh, with the human missions. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, there are uh, five missions with the 
uh, lots of astronauts uh, on the surface of the uh, moon and collecting rocks and samples and return them uh, by the Apollo mission, uh, where the Russians uh, just uh, uh, go directly and, and, and impact the collecting those samples and return uh, with uh, small quantities. But our mission is to collect uh, two kilograms or more uh, with uh, drillings, which is uh, penetrating the surface uh, and also collecting the surface samples at the same time. And the, the international community is interested in the Artemis mission, which is to build a gateway on the uh, lunar orbit. Uh, that will have a human-assisted sample selection mm -hmm. where with multiple robotic missions to the surface of the moon while collecting different samples of different regions. And there's also international interest in the polar regions where they, they, they think there's a deposit of uh, high water, mm -hmm. uh, lunar volatiles that are uh, interested by the international community to s sustain human life Wow. and produce uh, a fuel for future missions, uh, even using Moon as a stepstone to Mars. Sounds every one of those twists and turns are fascinating. Uh, just wondering how complicated this mission is. Well, here is the lowdown. Take a look. In 1978, visiting U.S. National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski presented China a goodwill gift, one gram of Apollo 17's moon rock. Half of the historic sample was given to a team led by Chinese scientist Ouyang Ziyuan. This tiny flake of lunar material inspired him, and in the following years, he proposed the Chang'e Project, China's lunar exploration program. If everything goes well, in a month's time, we're going to have some new moon rocks collected by the Chang'e 5 probe. It will add to the 382 kilograms of samples that U.S. and Soviet space missions brought back 48 years ago. It will collect two kilograms of lunar sample, shoveling some surface material, and also drilling a two-meter deep hole and extracting the soil from inside it, which will act like an archive of the moon, with a bottom recording information from a billion years ago, and the top more closely reflecting the present day. The work will be completed within one lunar day, or 14 days on Earth, so that a probe can avoid extreme overnight temperatures that could damage the robot. Once the samples are secured, the ascender will blast off to transfer the moon's samples to the re-entering capsule waiting in lunar orbit, which will then carry them back to Earth. In previous missions, the ascender would make the journey all the way back itself, but this innovation allows it to save fuel and gives us space to carry more samples. Well, that is about China's dream to the moon and how the current stage is uh, uh, developing as we speak. So what can we expect it comes back, Mr. Yang? Well, you see that from the video, you can see the whole the mission profile of our Chang'e 5 mission is quite similar to the Apollo program. You can recognize the lander and the ascender as the uh, descent part and the ascent part of the lunar module of Apollo program. I you can see. recognize the uh, orbiter as the service module of the lunar uh, Apollo program and the returner or the recentry capsule as the command module of Apollo program. So this is very similar and we choose the most complicated, much more complex than the former Soviet Union. So that is the reason we can get uh, more uh, samples than the former Sony and with this, uh, as you have mentioned, it will be recognized as a good preparation for the future potential manned missions to the moon. Mm. On the one hand, Dr. Ghosh, I mean, there's already huge development of new technologies, including the latest robotics, uh, robotics and also artificial intelligence and many things like that. Uh, and, but on the other hand, uh, what Will this uh, new mission made by China be able to help enrich the pools of knowledge and information? How do you see this uh, uh, two different sides of the same story? So this is called offshoots. Um, you know, you, it is very hard to say before you do it what will be the result. So I think you were talking about what are the scientific results of the mission. This is the same thing. The answer, my answer would have been, we don't, we, we won't know. It is some, something called serendipitous. It's something like you don't know, but you will be surprised to find it. For example, during the Apollo program, 
Um, there were very interesting offshoots from infrared thermometers to the pacemaker. Um, so you, it is very hard to predict. But before that, I also would wa want to make one tiny comment about the discussion as to what will you get back from this mission. It's very important to know we are entering a very different stage of exploration. So Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin that they want to set up a human settlement. And that's not really far off. So the um, focus is shifting from fundamental science, like figuring out when the volcanism happened, to how can you extract materials from the moon to support human living 24 hours a day, 36, uh, 365 days a year. So it's, this is called in situ resource utilization. How do you extract oxygen from the soil? How do you extract water from the soil? Mm. Because you cannot possibly take everything from Earth if you take humans um, on a human mission. So that's, that's what I think. Mm. Mr. Xu, uh, obviously Dr. Gosh is trying to remind us that there is still a huge space that China needs to develop in order to reach uh, that uh, specific uh, uh, stage of exploration about the moon now uh, pretty much uh, by the commercial activities in the U.S. So exactly how far China is and what is the goal of China's mission really? Well, the Chinese mission has many, uh, many goals. Uh, there's one uh, thing which is, uh, Professor Yang mentioned, the engineering goal, which means can we do it? I mean, uh, we have to demonstrate from all the connections, all the key moments of descending, ascending, docking rendezvous, transfer of the uh, samples, returning back to Earth in a high velocity. All of this needs to be demonstrated uh, and demonstrated well before we can conduct another step, which is a human mission. Uh, second is that the, the lunar volatile, uh, Professor has just mentioned, uh, the, lo uh, the lunar surface, we have uh, different uh, resource and different materials. We want to sustain human presence and maybe using that as a stepping stone to interplanetary missions. All of these needs to have further uh, collaboration on international stage. Uh, I was part of that effort as well with the ISECG, which is Interagency Space Exploration mm -hmm. uh, Coordination Group. That group uh, coordinates with 14 or even more nations uh, with space uh, capacity of exploring the moon and, and Mars and came up with architectural designs of how to proceed with that uh, approach. So China will be part of that and uh, with, uh, with no political influence or maybe even coming back uh, uh, from the, uh, the uh, Republicans to Democrats, we could even... In the U.S. In the U.S. <laughs> and we can improve in, in a way of collaborating with the international community in particular on exploration missions, which mm. is less sensitive and more conducive to, uh, to human beings. Well, if you look at the background that I have right behind, uh, you will see a starry night, if we could cut to that page uh, of our frame. But if you think about the current uh, complicated realities, uh, there we go. Uh, if we think about the complicated uh, geopolitics, uh, one would wonder, Dr. Ghosh, could we still have that momentum of cooperation? We earlier have already seen some cold temperatures in this regard. What about from now on? Well, it's a very hard question to answer, and there will be ups and downs if you look at the uh, relationship of different nations for uh, the last 100 years. There will be ups and downs. But um, you cannot deny a particular technology direction. So if if, for example, there was the smartphone revolution, and when it happened, it happened throughout the world. Same here, if there is a space revolution and this frontier opened up for commercial and human exploration, uh, I think at some point, all nations will need each other. So um, I don't know whether you have heard of the Artemis Accords. So that, that's a framework where um, the U.S. is trying to make some um, common sense rules for cooperation. So I, I, I think um, it's easy to get lost in the present, mm -hmm. but if you look to the future, um, there are many nations uh, who would like to uh, have this capability. Um, and, and so there is bound to be in some way uh, some form of 
working together. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, I mean, particularly for those of you scientists who are researching about the outer space, I mean, what we are having right here about geopolitics is such a tiny little part of history, not even worth mentioning. And yet, most of us were toppled down by the uh, kind of uh, reality right in front of us. But we need to look beyond that. The question really is, how can we look beyond that, uh, Professor Young? Well, um, especially about China-U.S. cooperation, well, China-Europe. There are, uh, there are good signs and there are bad signs. The bad sign is that you see that uh, Mr. Xi has already mentioned the Artemis program, the most uh, important program for U.S. in the future lunar exploration. And the Vice President Pence has mentioned that China will not be included. But on the other hand, you see that uh, after our Chang'e 4 mission be successful, the NASA has raised the requirement they want to use our uh, Magpie Bridge, the data relay satellites, to use that for a future uh, NASA mission to the far side of the moon. So you see, although uh, the U.S. Congress forbids the NASA to cooperate with China, but in, uh, for instance, the, the Charles Bolton, the former uh, administrator of NASA, has expressed his strong wish to cooperate with China. So all my friends from U.S., either those from the government, from NASA, from universities, or from the industry, has expressed their wish to cooperate with China. Mm -hmm. So I think in the future, maybe the situation can be changed. And on the other hand, the China is already have a very strong cooperation relationship with Europe and with Russia. This time, the Chang'e 5 mission, the ESA provide us telemetry support from the uh, French Guiana and mm -hmm. from the a place in, in, in uh, Spain uh, during the, uh, the, the, uh, the trip to the moon, also the, during the trip back. So they already have very good uh, cooperations with us. And also in the future, we will have more payloads from other countries on board our uh, right. uh, space probes. Cooperation is one thing, Mr. Xu. Uh, earlier, though, during the Cold War, we see a space competition between the United States and the former Soviet Union. So I was very relieved when I hear from both of you that China's uh, mission is not about uh, showing off the muscles, but rather on uh, what pragmatic results can it bring to our economy and also to the space and science research. So tell me more about what kinds of picture are you having, Mr. Xu, in terms of how nations can cooperate pragmatically speaking. I mean, geopolitics is a reality. So pragmatically speaking, what can we do together? Well, I think the China-U.S. relation is like a, it's like a marriage. You know, you have, a, you have honeymoon, but you also have quarrels, but you have fights, and you, have, you know, you sometimes sue for divorce. But sometimes you do work together and you work something out. Uh, I think there's uh, ups and downs. Uh, there, the relations uh, are subtle. I mean, uh, with U.S., with Europeans, with other countries, it's always subtle. Uh, but in, in particular for space sectors and space, you know, rocket technologies are due use. They're also for, uh, you know, uh, military technologies and defense technologies. And these are sensitive areas and uh, should, not, should not be, you know, we should work from the less sensitive areas, such as the explorations, mm. scientific missions. We have co uh, successful cooperation with the European Space Agency on the double star with the cluster, on the SMILE mission, which is more scientific-oriented missions. And also in the future, on pragmatic pr approaches, maybe commercialization is another area. You know, the, uh, there's a... a Commercial companies are going to the moon, and not to mention uh, low Earth orbit uh, satellite technologies and, and the piggybacks and uh, applications. Mm -hmm. So Chinese commercial sectors are also very de uh, developing very rapidly. I think we, have, we can have a connection between the Chinese and domestic uh, commercial sector with the international sector. On, on commercial basis of cooperation in addition to intergovernmental cooperation. When you talk about the China's private sector, is it mainly the private companies or the state-owned companies that are, that are operating the current uh, tests and also explorations? Well, some of the state-owned uh, enterprises are, are uh, spinning off some of the commercial sectors. Mm -hmm. And by commercial companies, I mean mostly private sectors. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of companies that are involved in space technologies and space applications, yeah. even ro rocket developments. Uh, we are seeing four or five companies that have already successfully 
uh, developed and one or two of them have launched successfully satellites into orbit. That's right. So we are uh, we're looking forward to these potential areas uh, where commercial sectors not only can benefit the international cooperation but also validate technologies with lower cost. Mm. We don't want Dr. Gosh uh, to wait too much uh, because I know your time is yes. very important, uh, precious, uh, particularly you're on the mission to yeah. Mars. So tell me more, Dr. Gosh, uh, what are some of the most challenging areas you and your colleagues in NASA, if you can reveal, uh, are working in terms of going to Mars? And how do you identify areas that you can cooperate either with China or with others during that journey? Right. So before that, let me just yes, let me just make a quick comment. Sure. So we are talking about international cooperation. That is very pertinent today. I understand. But I think we are trying to cross this divide where a private company act or two private companies are trying to make this commercial. And once there's a commercial need, a commercial reason to go to the moon, the bilateral cooperation between or multilateral cooperation between countries will not become that relevant. Case in point, if, if say mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos and uh, Elon Musk are able to make this a trip to the moon possible for $50,000, then there will be a space sector. The world tourism budget is a few trillion dollars. Even if, if this became a $50 billion sector, can you imagine how much jobs it would create on Earth? And that would be, um, that would be the reason to go to the moon. Mm. So you wouldn't need to collaborate. These private entities will make their own partnerships and head to the moon. Mm. Okay, coming back I to your I hope it's not just the jobs on the moon, but jobs on the, on the Earth, but also jobs on the moon. No, there are jobs, on, mostly will be jobs on the earth, right? You need engineers, you need coordination, you need yes, people to book, like in the travel, uh, travel industry. Right. Here, the, the question that you asked, um, um, so probably three years back, um, Elon Musk um, is putting, uh, put together his plans of how to go to, the, um, go to Mars at a very affordable price. The um, spaceship is being built as we speak. Um, so he's trying to make these launch vehicles and um, space, uh, 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 which will change the game. Change the game as in change the cost structure from maybe $100 billion to go to Mars to maybe $200 million. Um, so it will be tremendous. For $200,000, um, uh, SpaceX will do a return trip per person to Mars, will be huge. And so that is what the U.S. is working on, not the U.S. government. There is this company, the private company, um, which, which Elon Musk runs. Okay. A lot of commercial for Elon Musk, certainly, you have been doing today, Dr. Ghosh, I have to say. Yeah. Putting jokes aside, yeah. I know you gentlemen. <laughs> all have a huge picture in mind. That is the outer, beautiful outer space that we have right here. What is your best wishes to this mission and hopefully for international cooperation? Very briefly from every one of you. Well, I hope we, after coming back, we can have exchange of samples with US and also with Russia so we can have a more comprehensive understanding of the moon. Sounds fascinating. I really want to have a peek also of what China could bring back from the moon. It would be wonderful. And Mr. Xu? I think the samples are one area. You know, you can learn chemically, uh, mineralogically, uh, petrologically, isotopically, and uh, geologically. Learn, learn a lot of things from the samples. But uh, my wish would be a international cooperation on lunar missions, mm -hmm. in particular based on Chang'e 6, which is a redundancy of Chang'e 5, that can land on the polar mission for internationally interested uh, lunar volatiles and minerals and resource. Chang'e 6, we're already looking forward to it. And Dr. Ghosh, briefly, what can we wish for? I wish that the team has fun in the process, <laughs> and the public has, has fun in the process. The biggest joy here is, to, is the joy of scientific discovery. It is the joy of looking at observations 
and saying, well, this doesn't make sense. Okay. And that is when you discover a process. And so that is what I wish for them. Let's have fun. And I've been having fun talking to you guys, uh, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, Amitabha Ghosh, uh, Yang Yu Guang, and uh, Xu Yan Song. Really appreciate it. All the best luck to the Chang'e 5.